So this is the introductory video for primary sources for History 131, U.S. History since 1877. Um, so I'm hoping that you have at least heard the term primary source before. But just in case you haven't or you think you know but you're not sure, um, I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same footing. So what we're talking about with primary sources are materials that were created by specific people in the past in that moment in time. Uh, so for instance, an example of a secondary source would be a regular textbook that you might pick up in a history course, or a book, say, written about Alexander Hamilton, and that book was written in 2007. So for primary sources, what you're really looking for is the writings of Alexander Hamilton himself, or for instance, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, or Martin Luther King Jr.'s Letters from a Birmingham Jail, something that comes from that specific person in that place and time. Um, the great thing about primary sources is they can be lots of different kinds of media. Um, so I mentioned letters, um, speeches and addresses, um, but you can also look at things like diaries, newspapers, government documents and reports, um, but even things like photographs, posters, um, movies, radio and TV. All of those things can be considered a primary source based on when they're created and who they're created by. So. The reason why we're going to focus so much attention on primary sources in this course is that they give us a glimpse, a sort of uh, window into the past, basically through the eyes of the people who were there. Um, because I didn't live in 1963, and I don't think you did either, we won't be able to tell what the March on Washington was like unless we look at it through the eyes of those who lived it and experienced it. And so that's something that we're going to spend a lot of time looking at. And what that gives us is a, a better and more nuanced understanding of those moments. And what makes them so nuanced is those views from the past come with bias. Now you might think, but wait, secondary sources are the bias sources, right? They're the ones that come from other people's opinions and perspectives, from the people in the future, if you will. Well, that's true, but the people in the past had their own biases too. And so what makes their writings valuable is not that they're giving us the pure, unvarnished truth, but that we can learn more about them and about the world they live in by better understanding their biases and where those biases came from. So in order to do that, we're going to be looking at some basic things to consider when we look at any kind of primary source. You want to know the author. Who created this? Who wrote it or took the photograph or made the radio recording? Um, you're also looking for audience. So the best example I can give is let's say you're sending a text to your mom about what you did over the weekend. That text might look different than the one you sent to your best friend uh, telling what you did this past weekend. So consider who the intended audience is because sometimes that tells you just as much as the person who's actually creating that particular material. Of course, the date also is important. And in this class, you're not going to have to memorize tons of dates. In fact, um, most of the time you'll have easy access to all of that. But understanding that something happens before or after something else or simultaneously with something else is really important. So for instance, at the same time that Martin Luther King Jr. is giving the I Have a Dream speech, there's also crises in, let's say, Vietnam or other places around the world. And how might those things be related? And finally, what's the motivation? If we're trying to figure out what this document or what this movie or what this thing from the past is trying to tell us, we need to understand the motive of the creation of this document in the first place. And that's probably going to be the trickiest one to get to, but I have some guides that might help you accomplish that. So when you're looking at these primary sources, what I really want you to understand, and it's important, is I'm not just looking for the what happened. I'm not looking for you to look for like the plot or, you know, okay, X, Y, and Z happened. What I'm looking at for you to do is to kind of understand what this might have felt like, how emotionally you might understand the past better, how emotionally you might understand the people who lived in the past better. What kinds of choices were they making and why were they making those choices? The trick to doing this 
is you have to turn off your 2019 brain. So hard to do because, of course, we're trained to live in this moment now and to think in the way of this moment now. But the people you're studying have likely never seen 2019 and couldn't imagine what 2019 would actually look like. And so in order to understand them in their time, you have to turn that portion of your brain off and really try and imagine yourself back in the past. So what's interesting about the study of history is we actually use our imaginations a lot. So that's something you're going to have to try and do in order to be successful in this course. If you have any questions about how to accomplish this, you can come and see me, you can email me, um, we can try and FaceTime, whatever. Um, I want you to understand because it's important, obviously, to the success of this course, but it just might really show you the world in a really different way. And that's one of the goals of this course as well. All right. Thanks, guys.